we're quite excited about this panel. Um, engagement reimagined. It sounds uh, pretty futuristic, that's for sure. Um, and just to set some context, um, I used to work at IBM for a couple of years. And certainly what I really saw there is how they had imagined engagement within their organization. So, you know, as an employee, typically in the past, we, the, only, the only measure of engagement had been an annual engagement survey that was sent to employees uh, that the employees probably spent 20 minutes, maybe even longer completing. It's usually about 80 questions. Usually on a scale of one to five, sometimes a scale of one to seven. And then once you press send on those results, you didn't really hear anything more about the engagement survey for at least three to four months, other than a reminder, if you hadn't completed it, please to complete it by this deadline. Um, and then three or four months later, you might hear something from the leadership saying about the engagement results, usually to tell you that the scores had gone up or down from the year before. Actually, you only used to find out if the scores had gone up. You didn't usually find out if the scores had gone down. And maybe one or two areas that the, the, the leadership had identified um, from the engagement survey they were going to take some action on. But that was pretty much it. Um, so when I got to IBM, I was quite surprised to see that it was very, very different there. Yes, there was still an annual engagement survey, but we were continually being asked questions on an ongoing basis. And at first, I was like, oh, they seem to be asking a lot of questions. But actually, what they would actually do is actually take action almost immediately on, on some of those questions that they were asking employees. And actually, even better, you could see if you'd responded to a question where you sat compa in comparison to the other people that had asked the question in the organization as well. And increasingly, they started to ask questions that were open text as well. Um, you know, and, and again, action used to be taken on that. And actually, as I, as I got into IBM, I understood that one of the things that IBM did do a lot of was to do sentiment analysis on how employees are feeling, either positive or negatively. Um, and actually, one of the, 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 the chief HR officer in her office has a big screen of all the trending topics worldwide on, what's on, on what employees are saying in, in IBM at any one time. They take that sentiment from the internal collaboration tool that most IBMers use, um, and they all look at words that are trending in different parts of the world or globally, and they also look at sentiment on social media platforms as well. It's all anonymized, so you're not actually looking at individuals, but you are looking at the overall trends. And one famous story within IBM was around the use of Uber. Uh, so like lots of organizations, IBMers all around the world were using Uber and other, other, other similar type organizations to get to and from customers. Someone in IBM decided that they were going to not process expenses from um, IBMers on Uber by a certain date. There was uproar. So there was lots of complaints and people starting petitions on these social platform both externally and internally. And within a day, it was the number one trending topic um, on the CHRO's dashboard sitting in her office. She was like, what's going on? You know, and then they, they dug into it a little bit deeper. This, this decision hadn't come from HR. She was able to go out that same day, communicate to, to IBMers that, thank you for, for voicing your concern over this decision. I agree it's a bad decision. We will reverse it. All within a day of this happening. And Typically, um, those of us that work, have worked in large organizations, or in fact, any size organization will know, it's very rare that a decision will be taken that quickly. But this was an example of how you engaging um, your employees, you can actually take action in, in almost in real time. So we're going to talk a little bit about that now, and, and, and obviously the panel have been introduced. So I'm going to go, we're going to do it a slightly different order. I'm going to come to Tan Mai last because he's, um, he, he's from a solution provider. We have a great panel here, and we had a, a really good prep call a couple of days ago when I was driving to the airport in the rain in the UK. Um, but we have three practitioners, and we have one, um, Tan Mai, from, from Infido, a solution provider who's working with multiple organizations to help them basically reimagine engagement. So... Prasad, I'm going to come to you first, to just a quick introduction to yourself, but also how you're reimagining engagement using analytics and, and personalization um, at ClearTrip. Thank you. So uh, we started this beautiful day with uh, Esther uh, sharing a metaphor on LX. 
you know, I want to share a metaphor of just today. I'm sure in the evening all of us are looking forward to the comedy show with Anirban Das. When you t think of our topic on engagement, I can't help the role of HR in that context of a stand-up comedian. Uh, most of our lives sometimes is about, like a stand-up comedian, you have to crack a joke and you don't know which is actually going to get the maximum laughter back from the audience. Still, the challenge for HR is at a greater degree, right? Because you'll have to reinvent new jokes repeatedly for the same set of audience. And we don't sometimes have the freedom and privilege to use all the gali words that uh, stand-up comedians are able to use when, when you present, right? But having said that, you know, the fundamental thing is that for many decades, this clan of HR folks have actually been on a relentless pursuit on keeping the engagement up in utmost, and it's a very difficult thing to do. And I think for that, this fraternity needs an applause. Right? It's not an easy, easy uh, work that we do every day. Right? So I, I have been with um, uh, Clear Trip. It's been a humbling last three years in particular, where uh, you know, we moved from a single geography business to today, uh, in three years, we are in eight countries, 14 nationalities, and four time zones. It's happened at a very, very rapid pace. We talked about complexity earlier during the day. So while I share with others, I just want to also leave the perspective that in, in all this, um, what it has really bought, if you look at what's happening, what it has really bought is it's actually uh, bought the people into the center. And I'm saying this not just as a philosophy, but in reality, right? All the data that we are able to uh, extract today, irrespective of the businesses that you are, you are able to generate the data which is about the customer or the employee at a much more closer, intimate level. Which means that as an organization, we are far more tethered to people. And that brings the people right into the center of things. Thank you. Vipin? Hi, thank you, David. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so in my role uh, at Digital at KFC, I'm uh, responsible for driving uh, the digital transformation across the organization, across all the stores that we have. I think uh, as a, in my role, uh, one of the key mandates that I have apart from uh, leveraging or identifying the right technologies across various functions, including HR, is the actually change management. And when I joined, I think it's a typically, uh, you know, you'll say the digital vision is I want to, uh, digital vision for any organization could be, I want to make my customer's experience digital and seamless and enriching. I think the first uh, task for me was to actually uh, change the perspective that employees are actually equally important as customers. Right? So uh, when somebody is serving you a chicken zinger burger at the store, uh, his the perspective about the organization or how his experience is with the organization actually drives the customer experience. And in uh, such a distributed environment with four, five hundred stores uh, uh, in India, uh, we I can't control that single moment, right? So, so that's the first perspective that um, I think that whole change management and momentum and that uh, thinking, uh, change in thinking, uh, driving that is uh, one of my key mandates. And then obviously the second aspect uh, which I'm trying to bring uh, at the organization is identifying the technologies to actually leapfrog from where we are to actually the digital world. And we all talk about millennials and Gen Zs. And I think the, the complexity that we have, which probably, I don't know, maybe some may appreciate that we are dealing with our workforce who's actually uh, you know, relatively low on education, uh, relatively low on uh, the, the, the income, uh, no internet access in stores, uh, no access to official email IDs or desktops, but yet I have to, or we have to create that digital experience for them. So whatever then uh, technologies we choose, whatever uh, engagement uh, technologies, whether it's enterprise collaboration or uh, using AIML, uh, you know, attrition management like Infido or anything else, uh, that has to be in that context. So that uh, uh, blue collared workforce with limited, uh, and then the, I think the above, uh, the, the, the biggest factor in this is the loyalty, right? Uh, in in that, uh, that, when we talk about blue collared workforce, people can actually switch employers for a mere 1,000 rupees change in uh, salary, right? So, so that's what we're doing, and then obviously there is a lot more uh, on how uh, we are leapfrogging, as I said, from a manual to digital, and keeping that automation piece uh, that, that is happening. 
Thanks, David. Can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, within Genpact, I think we have gone back and forth a little bit and for all the right reasons with all the right results. Uh, like most of the companies in the industry, we also started with you know external partners like Gallup coming in, administering the service for us for the sake of anonymity because that was a big thing back then, right? And giving us results at anonymized levels and then you know the feedback owners taking on. Uh, it worked really well for us for about a decade and a half. After that, we felt that, I mean, uh, for us to be a little more agile, a little more fast-paced, why don't we insource it? And we insource it for good for five years. And it has been really, uh, working really well for us because we could trigger those surveys at will. We could customize those surveys just a little bit to suit the target audiences. Now, in the last three to four months, we have taken an even bigger leap wherein Tanma and team is actually helping us uh, to completely transform the employee engagement and experience bit using artificial intelligence. Um, so far, the results, because it's early days, it's still gestation period, but uh, the early results are promising, positive. And what technology has done essentially is it has opened up the avenues which nobody thought were possible about a decade ago. For example, think like hyper-personalization. It was very difficult to hyper-personalize reach outs to people without the right technology being there. Uh, people used to be scared of asking open-ended you know, questions to people because who would manually sit and sieve through 10,000 responses and then come back with one chart saying what is it that people are really saying, right? Now the technology, the natural language processing, text analytics has matured to such an extent that you can actually take millions of textual responses, you know, analyze them literally at, at, at the click of a button and have the real-time insights with you. So that's where we are in the employee engagement and experience journey. Thank you, Preful. So, so Tam, my slightly nuance on that question, obviously you're a solution provider and one of the providers that's kind of disrupting the engagement market, to be honest with you. You know, why did you choose the engagement market to get into partly? And what are the, you know, to, to build on some of the stuff that Prafel was saying, what are some of the technologies that are really helping to change the way organizations are, are doing engagement with, with employees? I think that's a fantastic question and a context I thought I'll give everybody before we started. This is an extremely special moment for me because uh, three years back at TechHR, uh, I was sitting outside in the lobby because uh, we guys didn't have money to pay for the entry ticket, right? And now I'm on a panel where every single panelist is a customer of ours. So it's, it's, it's extremely, extremely uh, honorable to be here. And uh, of course, thanks David for that question because uh, how it all started was, uh, and why we even ch uh, chose engagement was uh, a, a lady named uh, China Gorman. She was the ex-CEO of Great Place to Work. She was kind enough to step out as a speaker to the lobby because I was sitting in the lobby in the same building. And she actually made a statement where she said, uh, Tanma, in the last 10 years, uh, engagement as a space, employee engagement has felt good but has it really made a tangible, measurable impact, right? And the way she made that statement coming from that background because she was uh, the CEO of Gateways to Work USA back then, it really hit me hard and I felt like this is a problem worth solving. So the last couple of years, uh, we got the opportunity to speak to 200 CHROs and really understand the depth of why engagement has been a problem. So two points came out loud and clear and they're very simple, right? So the first one was that we are now in a candidate or let's say sort of say an employee-driven economy. Right? So, so much as your employees are serving you, it is equally important for us to serve our employees as well. Right? And Make My Trip and GE's leadership sort of gave us some ideas that, you know, can you really track the employee experience from their first to last day, from their perspective and not our perspective for a change? And I think that was very fascinating. The second one, which I think Profil has already mentioned, is that annual engagement surveys are really challenging, right? Because whether you pick up an IBM Connexa or a Gallup Q12, like he said, an Eon Hewitt or Taz Watson, the biggest problem is they're treating employees like data points, right? Everybody gets the same questions. Imagine everyone in this room is getting the same question at the same time, once every year. Every year, the same questions keep repeating because benchmarking is so critical for all of us, right? And today, employees are begging for a human, personalized, relevant conversation where someone really understands you and someone really expresses some emotions and not just a survey that's slapped across your face, right? So to answer the second part of the question, uh, the technology really uh, begged for a solution where you treat the employee like a human being. 
right? And when we speak about personalization and individuality, we had a simple idea. What if there was one individual? What if Genpact hired me and said, Tanmay, you have to speak to 85,000 employees regularly from their first to last day, come back to Pruffel and tell him who is unhappy, who is happy, who is most likely to leave, and the exact reasons why. And of course, on top of that, every single HRBP wants their own cuts as well, right, for their regions, et cetera, right? Tanma, I want you to do all of this alone, right? And the reality is HR business partners are doing this, right? The ratios are 500 is to 1, 1,000 is to 1. One guy is trying to do this for 1,000 people. And that's where we felt, you know, like AI or Amber or something like that could be really helpful. And I'm so glad to be with all of you on stage. Thank you. And, and I think... Moving, I think the technology is a big part of this, but it's not the only part, and we will cover other parts uh, during the conversation. But clearly, a lot of this is being driven by technology and the ability, perhaps all you talked about, the ability to do natural language processing and to personalize. What are the sort of things that you're, you're looking to personalize um, at Genpact using, yeah, using this, some of these new technologies? So one of the things, actually, Tanmay talked about, imagine somebody who has just stepped into the organization is barely 20, 25 days old, and uh, uh, the regular employee engagement survey hitting him, right? Asking him about how does he feel about the vision, mission of the organization, does he have enough L&D opportunities, so on and so forth. That poor chap would be confused because he's barely trying to get to understand the system. He has barely understood his KRAs from his manager, his or her manager, right? So this level of personalization is very, very important where the questions which anybody is asking me, whether it's a bot or a survey, are very relevant to me in my professional life journey. That's one. The second is from the feedback owner's perspective, right? Um, the biggest challenge with the traditional way of running surveys was time to action was humongous because we did not have tools and technologies to sieve through the data and give you intelligence at the click of a button. You could do it at an overall level, but you have 1,500 HRBPs and 2,000 you know, line managers who need cuts at their own level. That's also personalization at an HRBP level or at an operating manager's level. That's possible almost in real time and I mean if I told anybody about 15 years ago that we could do this they would have thought I'm crazy but but we are able to do it as of today and seeing positive tangible impact and Vivian, you mentioned the challenges involved in um, with with a predominantly blue collar workforce yeah how are you using technology to actually understand engagement there because obviously as you said it's it's the loyalty thing is key because yeah. people can just you know click their fingers and go somewhere else for a, a very small pay increase yeah no absolutely and i think one of the uh, key things uh, i mean two aspects we're trying to i mean we're trying to do and both are related to listening and uh, uh, hearing uh, the employee voice and i think one of the other key factors is imagine uh, uh, a a team member who's uh, you know a frying chicken in you know city of Guwahati, and he wants to convey a message to uh, the senior, the CPO of KFC, right? How do you do it? There is just so much like chain of command. They just uh, uh, if, if there was no digital, then humanly it will not be possible. And we operate in a multi-entity, multi-franchisee, uh, distributed geographical environment, right? So having something like that, personal touch uh, through uh, you know enterprise collaboration platforms, is something uh, that uh, we are working on. Uh, the other aspect uh, is uh, obviously uh, is around uh, creating that uh, personalization using AI and chatbots. And obviously, we are in discussions with. Uh, various uh, solution providers, including Infido, um, where, because the key there is a trust, right? So far, imagine a situation, I've been filling the surveys as we talked about for five years, uh, the survey scores are great, and everybody's sitting in their oval offices saying that, wow, we are great, but the metrics doesn't change. You know, the, you know, still we are struggling with the same uh, metrics or the realities on the ground. So how do you really crack that, uh, crack that thing? You know, how do, as sitting at uh, what we call it RSCs, which is called our, uh, restaurant support centers, how do we actually get the real pulse of the things which are happening on the ground? And I think, uh, th again, thanks to uh, these technologies, I think we are hoping that uh, with that uh, AI, we'll be able to uh, bring that 
trust to those employees. You know, they, where they feel that, okay, you know, somebody uh, from directly from HR, uh, CPO's office or CEO's office is here to listen to me. It is not just like, you know, check buttons or click in a box where, I mean, you talked about understanding the culture. I mean, where we deal is like, did you get your uh, uniform on time? You know, did your uh, RGM actually had uh, lunch with you? Did you understand how to cook, uh, you know, fry a piece of chicken? So the, the level is different, right? So, but I think uh, we are hoping that uh, using these uh, chatbots and uh, AI will be able to break that barrier and uh, create that trust. And I think once they start trusting that, you know, it's actually uh, this my voice or my pain area is actually directly being relayed to the top office and hence actions are being taken. I think that's, uh, that's where we feel will uh, be the real, I think, uh, uh, change for us that we are hoping this will bring. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and Prasad, I know when we had the, the prep call a couple of days ago, you, 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 know, you really wanted to talk about the trust element here. You know, the trust element may be about actually collecting and storing the data in the first place, but also the trust element about actually taking action. You know, I think, uh, <clears throat> see, one important recognition is the role that uh, HR has played around data is the integrity of data, the sanctity of the data, right? Anything that comes is about, is it an issue? Is it a feedback? It doesn't matter where it came from. Now, what's happened is, today with the technology, we are able to generate a lot of data. In many cases, even the employee is not aware that this level of data is actually there with the organization, right? And it, uh, behavioral data, mood data is on their day, right? Who doesn't go through it in a day? Now, if the trust is not there fun fundamentally in the organization, even with all the technology and data, we are not actually going to be able to improve the employee experience or the engagement uh, factor. So this actually brings up that today, actually, HR in the digital econ economy will probably really need to reimagine the whole proposition of trust. Because it is if, if you are working in an organization that it is going to get democratized, then think about it. The responsibility of HR to look at a framework where every custodian in the organization is able to keep the ethics and ethos of what HR maintained around the data and in a scalable manner. Right? What is the framework for that? How do you embed there? How do you build in transparency in an organization as a culture? For, and these are softer aspects as well, right? Because technology alone cannot generate the outcomes we want. It has to come with sufficient design thinking and application to get the potent effect. And, and actually, at Clear, at Clear Trip, you actually used some of this to help you with a, an acquisition that you'd made. Yeah, so it's a, it's a user case. You know, we know mergers and acquisitions, right? Sometimes they're like marriages. They're not like, I think it's a big fat lie when you say that marriages are made in heaven, right? It's, it's a difficult part of two individuals coming together with a promise of hoping to live a lifetime. So, so similar to that, the acquisition, in, in acquisition, if you actually see the employee engagement factor is a make or break. If you lose it on your day one in terms of an acquisition, then the entire synergistic effort that you want to actually derive is lost. On the contrary, if you're able to galvanize it, then it is a maximizer. Now, when we, we made a significant acquisition in Flyin in the Middle East, and uh, what it meant for us is both ClearTrip and Flyin coming together would mean a 60% market share opportunity in the entire online travel market of Middle East and MENA region, and an opportunity of 1.5 billion US uh, dollars of sales opportunity. Now, the complexity with that, when the deal was inked, is that for, you know, keep the cultural diversity integration aside, right? We had critical mass of employees in countries like Riyadh and Cairo where ClearTrip had no presence itself. So that is where we use technology extensively, putting listening channels right through the uh, due diligence phase, slicing and dicing that data to understand what are the nuances at a granular level? What is it at a country? What is it at a functional level? What is it at a team level? And actually triangulating that data with the respective leaders and then bringing your engagement strategy through the whole battery in personalizing that engagement to what would it actually mean when we fly down to Cairo and start to talk to the team? What would it mean to people walking into the office on day one when the communication comes and the entire set? When this whole engagement was over, we did a sentiment check and it's, the flying has about 350 people. 277 responses, 91% of the people expressing that 
They are extremely positive about the opportunity of clear trip and flying coming together. You sometimes, in some critical interventions, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And I think the fundamental learning for me personally was while technology, it was only because of the technology and listening channels and analytics that we were able to solve for the geographical complexity. But one thing is that the, any active engagement, the first thing is about active listening. You need to be able to actively listen, then to be able to curate and see what you need to do in terms of an intervention. Perfect. Great example. And Tamai, you've, you've worked with about 200 CHROs in India. You know, what are the, what are, keeping on the topic of use cases, what are some of the typical use cases and best practices that you're seeing, particularly in actually getting to action on, on these things? I think one, one of the things that surprised me the most, and I was in Colorado just uh, 48 hours back, was that uh, the fundamental differences between engagement in the Indian market and the US market are not as such, right? In fact, there was a very funny story that came about over there where uh, we were in a room this large. There were about 300 uh, employee engagement professionals. It was the first time I saw so many employee engagement professionals under one roof, right? <laughs> And uh, the speaker on stage asked, like, what's your biggest challenge? What's the biggest challenge in engagement from a technology standpoint, right? And this lady far at the back sort of uh, raises her hand, and you know how we all are, like, half of the room turns around, like, who's this, right? And she says, I work for the US federal government. The entire room turns around, right? And she's like, uh, we use uh, an annual engagement survey with 100 questions, and the entire room gasps, like, 100 questions, right? So of course, most of the challenges uh, rely on, around the fact that uh, we, we stop treating the employees as a human, right? And how do we really build trust, right? So one of the base, biggest risks and opportunities, both, right, are the trust factor, right? I'll give you a few examples. Often, more often than not, we believe that anonymity in itself drives trust, right? But it actually reduces engagement. Because if you make anonymity the default factor for communication, you're establishing a ground that, okay, you know what, maybe you don't trust us enough, right? The default has to be perhaps confrontation. In fact, Kim at Radical Candor has written an amazing book where she speaks about how you can express to each other without anonymity. The second piece was, of course, an interesting thing I read about in HBR, and I spoke to a few customers about it, Harvard Business Review. They say trust is toast, because 58% employees would actually trust a stranger more than their own boss. And that's more than half of the people in this room, right? And uh, that begs to differ that, you know, we usually say that uh, most people leave their managers and not their companies. So therefore, how much access do you really want to give to the direct line managers, right? Skip meetings exist for a reason, right? So I think that's where uh, the opportunity was, how do you sort of build this trust by establishing the expectations with the employee? Who has access to your data? List it down. Why do they have access to that data? And why are we using that data? Then right? perhaps steer away from anonymity. Some use cases, uh, I would say, M&A is, of course, the biggest one. Make My Trip, IBU Redbus was one of them. We did Flipkart, Mintra, Jabong. Like, it's uh, Amazon acquired Zappos in the US. It's very similar to that. Uh, m is a big one. If you're hiring aggressively, that's another big one. Uh, one thing I've noticed about engagement and people issues is until and unless you get hit by your first people issue or top performer leaving, nobody talks about it. Right? So some proactive signals are if you are hiring aggressively, you know people issues will crop up in the next few months. Or if people are leaving aggressively, hopefully not. Right? Then if you have a distributed geography, if you're opening offices across the world, that's again a potential recipe for disaster if you don't work proactively. So these are some use cases we've seen across the board so far, at least. Okay. And Prafo, um, thinking about linking some of this data with business data, have, have, have you got any examples at Genpact on whether you've actually really been able to drive some value in the business through using predictive analytics or engagement? Um, I would say yes, uh, and as I said, I mean, we are still in that gestational period wherein the technology is still settling down. Uh, what technology has done so far is it has obviously unearthed issues, but most of these issues were known issues which most of these annual engagement surveys would also unearth. But where technology has played the real part is the speed at which the, the, the feedback is now available to the feedback owners. So if I go back 10 years, something which I mentioned to, let's say, a typical engagement survey, it would have been actioned after three, four, five months. Here we are talking about three, four, five days. So that's the real impact. 
which which we are speaking in in today's uh, you know AI driven world. Perfect. Um, the time's going really fast, actually. My God, it's going fast. Has anyone got any questions that they'd like to ask the panel? I know if I can see four minutes being held up to tell me. No, okay, that's probably good actually because we want to get all the questions out. So I'm going to ask the last two questions as one question and then come to each of you, Vipin first. If you had to give one or two tips to, to people in the room that are thinking around reimagining engagement within their own organizations, what would they be? And then the last one, again, is kind of what's next? What's the next step for, for, for reimagining engagement within organizations? So, so Vipin, I'll come to you first. And you all have a minute each. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I think so. Uh, one tip I would say is that, at least from my experience at uh, KFC, is that, I, and, uh, and the way I started was change management. I think we should just, as leaders, as HR leaders or as digital leaders, I think we should not constrain our thinking uh, in terms of if we currently doing something very manually today. And I think the incremental thinking, uh, which is a natural human phenomena, is to actually maybe just let's see how automation works and uh, let's see how that incremental works. I think we should just not limit ourselves. And I think as, uh, as leaders, it is our job or responsibility to drive that leapfrog thinking. And I think uh, some of the success we are seeing lately, I think that is a, uh, that just, uh, that's a learning come from there. So uh, if something is manual, don't shy away from uh, you know, using AI, ML. And uh, uh, part of my role, uh, we are trying to bring that momentum saying, you know, when somebody asks you, how come a 10th you know, pass graduate, how will he respond to a chatbot? And then you know, uh, what kind of questions? You know, it's so open-ended. I think, uh, but I think if you have the right will and that right uh, motivation to impact the business, I am sure all these uh, technologies will work for us. Uh, what was the second question again, sorry? What's next? Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, my vision uh, is obviously, as I said, uh, for KFC is uh, completely digital, uh, seamless and enriching experience for our customers and uh, employees. Uh, so for me, uh, what next at KFC is completely digitized HR. Thank you, yeah. and Prasad? Two things, you know, um, one, um, in, in all this, uh, I think it's important to bring, uh, um, we don't be too obsessive about the numbers and forget that it's important to bring love back to the corporates and people uh, because we, we can get uh, a tendency where, um, you know, uh, we are so obsessed only with the numbers and it, it could mean different things for different corporates. For example, the technology can, can show you that, you know, here is where the problem area is, then focus and put a human touch there. Or a strategy where you're focusing on your critical talent because you cannot scale in terms of having a personalized touch with everybody, whatever be that uh, strategy. So I think uh, keeping that core human touch is important. I, I'm telling you, even with all the technology today, I'm a firm believer, I don't know how many of you, that it is work from home, et cetera, we say, but there is no substitute to the physical proximity with which teams need to work, especially in agile worlds today. It's uh, uh, distances are not going, technology is not going to solve for it so easily. That's one. So what's next if, uh, for me and if I look at it uh, for us and team, I think productivity, right? Um, the, there is so much of data that is coming. The, the, it is a fact that quality for talent is going to be at short and continuing to be shorter. So the only factor that can play a big win there is focusing on productivity. So I think it's very important to use this data and uh, uh, there are so many things that we don't normally see that we'll be able to bring into the window and then analyze and prioritize and see, you know, how we're able to improve the productivity. Okay, thank you. And um, Prafo, and I'll come to you last time, I. I'll answer both the questions together. For me, uh, That's good, cause we've I'm, a, I'm a firm <laughs> believer that uh, like most things in life for employees, employee engagement should also be self-serviced, right? Why does organization need to, need to take the complete ownership of giving, you know, the best in class experience to the employees? It's, it's employees, you know, onus at the end of the day. The role that an organization should play is how to enable the efforts which employees are making to ensure that their experience within the organization is world class. Now, if we take this philosophy, then the entire conversation which happens between an organization and an employee around these employee engagement surveys will completely transform. So you won't ask what, what screwed in your, in your professional journey. You'll say, okay, we know you don't have enough L&D opportunities, hypothetically. Have you done anything about this to alleviate the pain that you're facing? If the answer is no, 
then you would immediately understand that there is a lot of noise in the data. The actually really engaged people, and I don't have, un unfortunately, I don't have the data to prove this, they do make an additional discretionary effort. They just don't sulk in a corner, they make an additional discretionary effort to understand the pain and make an effort to sort of make things better for themselves and for the ecosystem around them. I think this is next for the employee engagement as a, as a practice. Okay. And Tamai, I'm only going to ask the second part of the question because we've, we've, it says time's up. What's next? <laughs> I think what's next is to stop uh, treating employees like data points and start treating AI like humans. And I'll tell you what that means, right? When I say stop treating employees like data points, we as HR need to be present at every single moment that matters. Present to congratulate them, present to understand how they feel from their first day to last day to three months to six months, to a manager change, to a location change, to a project change, to a recent leadership change, an m and right, or even their appraisal, or wedding, or whatever it is, right, to be there and understand how they feel, right? And when I say how do you treat AI like a human, it's fascinating to see that an AI has patience, it has the empathy, it has the time to understand how you feel, yet the difference is when a human makes a mistake, you give them an opportunity. When an AI makes a mistake, you're like, oh, this doesn't work. So give performance reviews to AI, give feedback to AI, right? and start treating AI as a she or a he, and start treating them like human beings or your own employees. I think that's something that's really worked for us, and that's something I'll recommend to all of you in this room. And I'll just say, think big, think employee first um, when you're thinking about this. Guys, Prasad, Tanmai, Vipin, Prafal, thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. Thank you so much, Tanmai.